Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A very good morning and uh, happy uh, belated uh, Independence Day for Malaysia Day. And uh, I have the the honor of uh, walking you through uh, the micro credential guideline that was put together by a team uh, of uh, academics. Um, and also retired academics um, to to uh, to clarify uh, micro credential uh, and through that clarification also to uh, energize and empower uh, institutions uh, to look at um, their traditional uh, programs. Uh, academic programs um, in a slightly different way. Or the popular word for this is to, to try and look at uh, the bundle, the package of uh, courses that make up your academic programs, diploma certificates, degree masters, and even PhD uh, as a collection of bundles, right? So the whole uh, the guideline is uh, to try and uh, guide you through uh, unbundling uh, or unpacking of this degree uh, so that we can have micro packages, micro credentials uh, that can provide uh, benefits to a lot more of the non-traditional learners. So that being the background, the MC is actually a series of initiatives that MQA has undertaken. Uh, since its establishment and everybody's uh, 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 well aware of the APL guidelines that came in 2011, followed by a, a series of guidelines on work-based learning, APL C, and, and also for credit transfer for MOOCs that all happened in 2016, was a very active year. And of course, now we're going to talk about the, the micro-credential uh, guidelines. In May of last year, there was a guideline that was issued. Uh, it wasn't an early guideline to try and get everybody uh, familiar with and to start thinking of uh, the micro credential guidelines. And then, and as was stated by uh, Mr. Zafir, uh, August, the, the GGP or the full or complete guideline for micro credential was released. Okay, these are a series of flex uh, initiatives that have taken place and we are at the uh, the point where you're looking at uh, micro credentials, uh, the GGP and micro credential, which is what I will talk about. And these are the four areas that I will uh, speak specifically about. Uh, and these are going to be about the policies um, and requirements as you venture into micro credentials. Uh, Karim will take you more on uh, really the, uh, the things you need to know. Uh, and appreciate as you go into developing and delivering an exciting uh, micro credential. Okay, so let's start. Uh, the usual good place to start is what we mean by micro credential. There are lots of definitions. Uh, okay. Uh, definition for the purpose of this guideline uh, it is. It has five elements there. Uh, it is a digital certification. Um, and you might ask, why do you put in the term digital there? Um, most of our certifications are in, in some digital form already, right? Uh, even if it is a paper-based, it is PDF uh, and comes in many other and provided in many different uh, forms or media these days. Uh, but micro-credentials, um, as they are now in the market, uh, use uh, digital certifications. So you will be familiar with badges, uh, which which are uh, portable, they are shareable. Uh, so uh, they can be very readily used uh, and even uh, secured. Uh, so it becomes much more difficult to tamper with these uh, kinds of certification. So it's digital certification, but in the interim, those who are offering uh, digital certifications, if you are not ready to go digital, uh, if you are still paper-based, um, 
as far as uh, the panel and the recommendation is, uh, there should be a period of uh, for, of time for people to um, to start this and then gradually um, start adopting a more digital ways of um, uh, presenting this information. Uh, number two, it has to be assessed knowledge. So it's not just a matter of attendance. Uh, these micro-credentials must uh, result in uh, attestation about the learner's uh, achievements, right? So there must be assessment, which, which is appropriate to the type of uh, program that you are having in place, type of um, micro-credential that you have in place. Um, and micro-credential by definition, right, by definition uh, are not macro. It's not a degree, it's not a full diploma, it's not a master's. Uh, it focuses on a small specific uh, area of skills or knowledge, um, which then makes it um, not only different from uh, from the uh, the conventional uh, qualifications or credentials that we have, uh, it also allows people to pick and choose, right? The specific areas they need to to complete their uh, set of skills that they're looking for uh, as a professional, as an individual. Um, so it's narrow. So um, it could be three months, six months. 10 hours, 15 hours a week. So it all depends on uh, the specific area uh, and the competency or the knowledge mastery that you are targeting. Um, and there are two types of uh, micro-credentials that I address in this guideline. One is uh, micro-credentials, which are um, the result of unbundling of your accredited programs. These are programs that have received uh, um, PA or FA. And also the second category, this is a standalone. These are not micro-credentials that are based on or drawn from your accredited programs. These are um, credential, uh, sorry, micro-credentials that are designed uh, with a specific need of the industry or individuals or professionals or profession in mind. Uh, and that can come can uh, fill in um, a big void that we have uh, in terms of lifelong learning in the country. And, and the last one is, this is, what is it for? Uh, it's for professional development, it is for technical enhancement, it is for uh, academic purposes, which means it can be stacked uh, towards a qualification. And, and lastly, it can be for personal, uh, personal development as well, uh, time management, gardening, fishing, what have you. So that's the, the definition that we've adopted. And I think it's a quite a common definition that is used um, around the world. Uh, and um, so that's the two types of micro-credentials, right? By unbundling your accredited programs and one that is actually free, or we call it standalone, uh, which is so if you are uh, someone who like to have full flexibility uh, and completely want to design your MC, then you're looking at the second category, which is a standalone. But if you are someone who wants to uh, immediately launch um, a micro-credential that is a component of this uh, uh, unbundling of your crypto program, then uh, that's the first category. This is from the accredited programs. But because it is from the accredited programs, uh, there will be some uh, limitation or conditions uh, in order to enjoy or continue to enjoy the accredited status. So the choice is there for you to, uh, to design. Um, mode of delivery, uh, it can be conventional. If you're running a conventional program, you want to continue the micro credential in the same mode, you can. If you are running an ODL program, a distance learning uh, program, and you want to offer it in that mode, you can, or it can be a combination. Uh, in the Surat Maluman, it is uh, clarified, even if you are conventional or ODL, there are some uh, allowances in terms of uh, conventional program, having some of the courses online. 
ODL programs, having some of the courses in, in, in a face-to-face -face mode. So please be directed by the uh, information provided in the Surat Maluman that uh, Mr. Zafir talked about earlier. Uh, so it can be in the same format, but of course the expectation and the hope is um, you will use the technology um, available uh, to offer uh, um, an exciting, a competitive uh, micro credential to your uh, learners. And these learners are, in our estimation, non traditional learners. They are probably adults, they are working people. So, um, something that is uh, convenient to them. Uh, it is open to all. If you look at Apple, uh, Apple A, it was limited to Malaysians. Apple C was open to all. And similarly, uh, the micro credential guideline or micro credential is open to all Malaysians. All Malaysians, sorry, all Malaysians and non Malaysians is open to all. And the third uh, aspect is um, of course, you want to name your micro credentials, right? Um, in naming your micro credentials, um, you should not in any way uh, label them or title them that create confusion about formal qualifications. Right, uh, because um, the formal qualifications uh, and the nomenclature are uh, regulated or protected under the Malaysian qualifications framework. Um, so you you have to uh, think creatively about labeling them. So we have suggested some uh, some ways to uh, label them, but that's uh, not a uh, prescription. Okay, so it's a suggestion. So you can think. Uh, uh, creatively about how you want to uh, name them. And so long as they are appropriate, they reflect uh, what their micro credential is about, and maybe even also the level uh, you are, the micro credential um, relates to within the framework. Uh, if you are looking at uh, um, types of micro credentials, the different fields, uh, if it is a professional program, the professional field, by professional field, I mean there is a, a body that is legally authorized to regulate the education and training uh, of uh, people uh, who will eventually be qualified to, to be a practitioner, providing services in that field, then you have to uh, consult the professional body. And um, you can do this with the consent and maybe even the collaboration of the professional bodies because professional bodies uh, require CPD. So there may be a lot of opportunities for uh, standalone post degree um, MCs. Uh, so that is for the providers to look at. Uh, and in the case of uh, professional bodies, um, you may not just consult, but I think you may need to do some convincing as well uh, that uh, this is a valuable um, support for the profession. Okay, the next uh, part of the guideline is MCs can uh, be developed uh, from the accredited programs at all levels of MQF. Uh, so certificate diploma, um, advanced diploma, uh, bachelor's, master's, and PhD, except foundation and postgraduate programs, that is master's and PhD, which are thesis or dissertation based. Okay, so that's a lot of uh, levels and a lot of uh, room to explore. Okay, uh, and I think uh, over time, um, as is usual with any guideline, we'll be looking at how it has evolved, uh, where it has, uh, where there are uh, challenges and how these challenges may be overcome uh, as time passes. Okay, but for now, this is the, uh, the guideline on the levels. Uh, and of course, when you say accredited programs, they are, um, these programs, uh, uh, they are both Provisionally accredited, but provisionally accredited programs uh, often um, uh, given approval by MQA with conditions. 
conditions to meet within six months, one year. And, and these conditions must be completed before you launch your micro credentials. And of course, the reason is obvious to everybody uh, that uh, we, when you launch the micro credential, you want to make sure uh, it has addressed any outstanding uh, issues that MQA has raised before you are unbundling them uh, for a different group of learners. And of course, fully accredited programs. Uh, and uh, because they are coming from accredited programs, then the micro credentials will have to follow the same uh, curriculum, right? Because they enjoy the accredited status. Uh, and with that privilege comes some uh, conditions. Um, uh, and this is uh, uh, a caveat for providers. Um, while you can do MCs at all, in all areas, at all levels, except for foundation, uh, professional programs you need to consult and also thesis based, uh, you will have to think about uh, the suitability of these courses uh, for micro credentialing. Uh, suitability maybe is, is in terms of what's the market demand for this kind of courses to be unbundled. The suitability issue maybe uh, because uh, it makes very um, extensive demand uh, in terms of resources and equipment um, and um, staff. So uh, the suitability issue is is key in terms of selecting which ones to to try uh, and micro-credentialize, okay? And I'm sure providers are quite sensitive to uh, this suitability issue, but um, the guideline does uh, draw your attention to this. And um, micro-credentials um, developed by a provider, after having launched it yourself, at least for one cohort, uh, you can actually extend this to your franchise partners. Many providers have franchise partners running their programs. So if you have micro-credentials, which are component of those programs, you can actually extend uh, the running of or the implementation of these micro-credentials to them as well. And, and they may be in a different region of the country, different parts of the country, and, and therefore able to ex, uh, extend the access to this, uh, of these micro-credentials to many more learners uh, than, uh, would be possible if you're just doing it in one place, maybe in Klang Valley. Uh, and also, um, you can uh, partner with others, not your franchise partners, but others with whom you don't have a franchise arrangement. Uh, and you can, up to 70% of the courses in your accredited program can be uh, micro credentialized and offered through these uh, partners. Uh, to the market. So that's uh, that allows you to uh, not only offer it yourself, but through your your franchise partners uh, with whom you have franchised your accredited programs, but also to other partners. There may be colleges and other entities uh, that are able to um, extend the program um, to the learners in, in the organization or in the geographical area. Uh, but Ultimately, um, the, the institution responsible uh, for the MC uh, needs to ensure that there is good, clear agreement uh, in terms of quality assurance, uh, because these are coming from accredited programs. Uh, so if the partners are not living up uh, to uh, the, they, are, they are part of the agreement, then it can actually affect accreditation. So it's important that uh, providers um, are careful and do their due diligence in terms of selecting partners and monitoring how they are um, implementing the micro credentials uh, to, to protect the accredited, accredited status of uh, the program and also the micro credentials that are drawn from these programs. Um, entry requirement. Uh, learners who are enrolling on your micro credentials uh, need not have the entry requirement that is required for the accredited academic program. For example, if the diploma requires an SPM with three credit, someone has got to enroll in this uh, micro credential, 
he or she doesn't need uh, that requirement, does not need to meet that requirement just to enroll on the micro credential. However, if the learner wants to uh, stack uh, these micro credentials, these are different packages of courses from a diploma or degree, with the intention of eventually seeking the qualification, um, the bachelor's or the diploma, then um, the provider must inform these learners, hopefully from the outset. And also, particularly, we put on a threshold when they are they are taking about 30% of the courses through the micro credentials. Uh, they need to be informed and made aware that if they want to seek the qualification, they need to fulfill the entry requirement for the program, which is either a formal entry requirement, you know, SPM or diploma, or STPM, and so on and so forth, uh, or an FLA uh, to um, complete uh, the, the group of my, my, my credentials. Uh, this is what we popularly call a stacking. Um, towards the the um, full qualifications, but if someone just wants to take two or three micro credentials from a bachelor's degree and that's all he needs, uh, then uh, there is no requirement that he meet uh, meet the entry requirements for the program. Right? He can um, can exit uh, the with the micro credentials that he has gained uh, that may be enough for his purposes. Okay, um, and um, but having said this, when you are looking at micro credentials, uh, responsible providers will think of what are the the, the uh, prerequisite knowledge and skills that uh, an, a learner need to bring to successfully complete a micro credential. Uh, so it may not be a formal qualification, but it may be in terms of numeracy, in terms of uh, digital skills. Um, and other um, requirements that are necessary for someone to enroll and successfully complete. And if you go to MOOCs, if you go to many other courses, there are uh, such um, uh, entry uh, behavior uh, described. Uh, sometimes they say it's preferable that you have this. Um, if not, you need to prepare to spend more time than is stated in the program. It may not be something that you can achieve in a week. For you, it may be three weeks because you are coming with some deficits. Uh, so uh, that is that is uh, what we expect HEPs will do, even though we don't, we, we are saying here, you don't need to require the formal entry qualification when someone wants to take a package, a micro-credential that is drawn from uh, an accredited program. This is for graduation. Eh? There's no minimum age requirement for someone to enroll in a micro-credential, okay? Um, but I would think that uh, they would have already some years of education, schooling, before they are ready for micro-credentials at the diploma level uh, or from the diploma program or from a bachelor's program. But this is in terms of uh, minimum age for graduation, right? Uh, if they want to seek the qualification in order to graduate and obtain the qualification, then this is the minimum uh, age at which they can graduate. You may ask why. This is to harmonize it with the different pathways we have right now. There is uh, yeah, the entry into the program through um, the normal formal requirements, your diploma, your STPM, your bachelor's. Uh, and so on and so forth. Then there's also the FLA requirement that you can go in into the program. And you can see there, we put down the FL micro credential. So for those who uh, complete a program but don't have FLA, they don't have the formal requirement, then uh, MQA will um, announce or come up with what we call an FL micro credential, which is a, a slightly different version of FLA. Um, at this point in time, uh, it is intended to be just the portfolio um, by the learner in order to fulfill this entry requirement issue because it doesn't have an FLA, um, it doesn't have uh, formal qualifications. So this is to 
ensure that someone who finishes all the courses and ready to graduate uh, is not in, in uh, because of uh, these two requirements, you or she is unable to graduate. So this is um, the opening, right, for the uh, the individuals. Um, however, in most cases, typically we we think that most of the uh, micro credential, the all the, the non traditional learners, uh, these are working people, adults who are coming in, will already be older than the minimum age for graduation stated uh, in this uh, slide. However, you could have a situation where um, someone is exceptional. So he goes through the micro credentials, uh, expects all of them and completes them in record time, right? Uh, degree is a three year period. He finishes in a two and a half uh, year and he hasn't reached the minimum age stated here. In which case the, uh, the, the highest academic uh, body within the institution, usually the Senate, um, or however it's called in the, in the institution, uh, can look at this case and uh, provide uh, the exception to this, this uh, requirement. So there is still flexibility, but we think this is going to be uh, uh, um, an exceptional few candidates who might actually go through this uh, and, and be ready to graduate, but then they are not of the age stated here and hence that holds them back. So we do not want that to happen. Uh, especially for these bright uh, learners. So the Senate can actually make the, the call. Um, so um, how can you uh, design, deliver, and, and recognize the credentials? Um, of course, a single HEP can um, unbundle their academic programs and offer it to non-traditional learners. And and uh, once they uh, complete all the uh, packages, they have uh, stacked all the micro credentials, which fulfills the requirement for the program. Um, he or she can graduate uh, subject to two conditions. One is the age that I mentioned earlier in the earlier slide. Uh, they are in the at least above this age uh, for that particular type uh, level of qualification. And number two, they have the entry requirement for the program or they have FLA or they apply for on the Apple for micro credential, which is a, which is a unique type of Apple just uh, for this type of uh, situations. Uh, and you can graduate. Uh, that's one in a uh, single HEP, but you can also have multiple HEPs working uh, as a consort consortium uh, and allowing students to pick courses, uh, micro credentials from different different institutions, uh, and then stacking them together. Uh, and if they would prefer to have a formal qualification, they can actually present it to uh, any one of the uh, participating um, HEPs, higher education providers. And these higher education providers can, uh, these are coming from accredited programs that can actually uh, recognize them through credit transfer. This is basically horizontal credit transfer because they are the same level. Uh, and um, they can do this up to 70% of the credits in the degree. And that extra 30% is something that you have to take with that particular awarding HEP. Uh, it could be still uh, in micro credential format. It could be in the conventional format. It may be in uh, business uh, learning format. But the thirty percent is with the awarding, so that the awarding institution um, itself has um, assessed the candidates uh, for the thirty percent uh, of the balance of the credits, and is uh, this allows them to be satisfied that this uh, learner uh, is. Um, good enough and it meets all the requirements to uh, to be honored with their qualification okay uh, so this is for the accredited ones of course the standalone ones that we talked about uh, which is um, um, not for accredited programs um, they can still be recognized uh, from when this standalone programs not necessarily for HEPs could be from anyone offering 
uh, those can be assembled and this can go through uh, the provisions that exist right now for for MOOCs, credit transfer for MOOCs, if these uh, micro-credentials are MOOC-based. Um, and under FLC, which recognizes all forms of learning, formal, uh, non, sorry, non-formal and informal learning. So there is prescription for, uh, provision for this to be recognized in, uh, in academic programs uh, towards uh, full, uh, towards the qualification, okay? Um, but there are limitations, so how much of this can be recognized uh, right now. Uh, but there is a guideline that is coming, uh, that is due to come out uh, soon which is called FLQ, which will provide a, a more seamless uh, pathway for people who have taken MOOCs from all over. And that, that is, that's one coming up. So soon there will be a, a, a more um, appealing, attractive pathway for people who have assembled MOOCs from uh, universities, colleges, uh, training institutions, from MOOCs all over the world. Uh, and you can actually, um, take them through the FLQ pathway that is soon to come. So I don't want to get ahead of that. Uh, uh, wait wait, uh, uh, and, and look out for uh, this initiative in, in, a, in a short, maybe a months or weeks time. Uh, this is how it can, this is an illustration of how it can look like what I've said earlier, right? This is an illustration. Um, the, the, the credits and terms used are merely illustration. Okay, I'm, I'm not suggesting here that your micro credentials should be 20 credits. And they must be called advanced and intermediate and basic. No, this is purely for illustration. Uh, so uh, do not think this as part of the guideline. Huh? This is a slide that illustrates um, the, the ideas contained in the guideline. Uh, these are how it can uh, be worked out, but uh, do not take the details uh, as prescriptions. Uh, certainly for, uh, for micro-credentials from accredited programs uh, and also non-accredited uh, or the standalone, credit transfer policy is very, very important um, for uh, the higher education um, institutions. So this, uh, this policy needs to be very clearly documented and laid out so that you can manage uh, these credit transfers, especially if they come from a different setting. Um, if it is your own micro-credential, there's no credit transfer, it's a completion issue. If it comes from uh, a consortium of other higher education providers with, with whom you have already formed uh, an agreement, then it is still credit transfer. Uh, but um, it is done through uh, a specific agreement, so it becomes much more smooth and, and more seamless for the learners. And it could be the third type earlier talking about standalone coming from different areas, in which case uh, there's more challenge in terms of looking at each one, understanding the outcomes and, and matching them with your program to provide transfer. So that requires um, credit transfer policy and practice and processes and people in it um, who are well trained to handle this, and and the guideline also provides for how you can go about uh, doing your credit transfer. So it's not just uh, uh, credit matching, uh, just uh, matching one uh, unit to one unit. So it could be many units to one unit. Um, so uh, this is to uh, ensure that the credit transfer is more flexible in in addressing uh, micro-credentials, especially those that are standalone, okay? Uh, those that are coming out from, from uh, accredited programs uh, need to follow the accredited program, uh, the program that is accredited, uh, so there will not be uh, too much of uh, matching issues. But if they're coming from standalone, then there is to be uh, careful uh, evaluation in terms of um, do they match, uh, and therefore can credit transfer be provided. And uh, the guideline also provides um, um, a section on quality assurance. For micro-credentials that are part of accredited programs, uh, they will definitely be subject to 
the internal quality assurance processes and also external quality and QA, and also the internal processes. So they are part of uh, of the accredited program. So they, they will go through this. But if you are standalone uh, program, then this is uh, uh, um, a guide to you to, to come up with and, and deliver um, quality micro-credentials that can be recognized and valued in the marketplace. And this, um, the seven criteria, uh, cri criteria mentioned here are very common. I'm sure you can uh, we've seen this in many places. So understanding the market needs to be market driven. Uh, the outcomes are very clearly stated. Um, the, there must be assessment for micro credentials under this guideline. It has to be, there has to be assessment of the learning. Uh, and um, there is good monitoring and review of, uh, of the design, the delivery, the, 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 the lessons, uh, the learning. Uh, and there are good system and resources to support the delivery. These are the people, these are your IT resources um, and your learning materials um, and, and what have you. Okay, that's, and the sixth one is the learner experience. Uh, you need to monitor and, and, to, and to ensure that you are, uh, you are taking the pulse of the learners in terms of uh, the expectations, the experiences and how you can actually uh, incorporate this as part of your monitoring and review processes. And the last one is actually learner data. This is where the batch comes in. Uh, how do you keep this data? How do you share this data? How do you ensure that this data is readily available for the learner to use it in, in whatever context? And, uh, and how can they verify and authenticate these things? And, and in order to uh, help the freestanding uh, micro-credentials uh, as part of the guideline, MQA provides an option for the providers of this uh, freestanding or standalone micro-credentials uh, to seek MQA review. This is not accreditation. It's just a quality review uh, where MQA will will review your, the, the, the system that you have. It is basically an effectiveness of your system and come up with the uh, recommendations um, and commendations where it is necessary to, to improve your system further. And for that, uh, of course, a quality mark will be provided. And this is uh, useful in a very crowded market to show that you have taken an extra step uh, to have external validation of the value of uh, the quality of your micro credentials. But this is optional. This is for standalone MCs. Um, and this is what the MCs can, can do. Okay. They are, we are talked about component of uh, accredited programs. That's the the pink box on the left of my uh, slide. Um, so you can actually break it up. Again, uh, uh, my, my uh, the caveat is these terms and that I have used in the boxes are not uh, prescribed by MQA or by me. These are just for illustration purposes only. Uh, so they can be unbundled uh, into micro-credential packages um, and uh, and offered to non-traditional learners, but micro-credential can also um, be additional to the diploma or degree. Uh, okay, so it could be added as something that uh, that students desire, like to do, um, or uh, something that adds uh, currency to the program. Right, you are unable to actually uh, review the program and, and include many of them the things, but it could actually be um, uh, complementary. So you build, an, for example, an MC in big data uh, together with a computer science program or a business uh, degree. Uh, and the one on the left, the uh, turquoise um, boxes, uh, this is what uh, Zafir mentioned. They can even be 
uh, a substitute for a degree, right? Um, so there's no uh, degree or qualification award here. There are only a series of micro credentials. And uh, if uh, they are valuable, they are recognized, uh, then the learner, uh, the funding bodies, the employers um, may be able to use this as a proxy of quality of uh, or capability of an individual, uh, which in most cases today, you're looking at a formal qualification. Do you have a certificate? Do you have a diploma? Do you have a degree? And so that's a, it's all the different uh, possibilities in terms of micro-credential um, that this uh, guideline uh, addresses. Uh, but it's up to the institutions to think how they want to conceive uh, their micro-credential journey, right? And uh, I think um, uh, Prof. Karim will be talking about uh, that particular part of the journey, um, how you want to go about, uh, what are the good practices, uh, and how it can be a very exciting, new, uh, innovative way to uh, to look at existing programs and and capture um, uh, even a much bigger section of the population. Uh, this is the micro credential guideline in brief. So. If you're not looking at all the rest of this, uh, the last slide will give you what it is. Uh, it is digital certification and assessed learning um, in a very narrow field. And it can, it can be a part of a credit program or standalone, and uh, it serves a variety of purposes. Uh, how can it be delivered in uh, open ODL, conventional, and also combination uh, of these modes? by who, by higher education providers, and also other providers. Okay, the standalone can come from uh, any other providers as well. And how do you um, testify to this learning? Uh, digital certifications. We use the word digital certifications, but uh, it can also include paper certifications. And I think that is, uh, we would like to see that as an interim arrangement. And eventually, uh, not too long into the future, we should be looking at uh, digital batches way to go. And of course, we are talking about two categories of micro credential. One that is coming off your accredited programs, which we think is the, the early win that you're going to have, the immediate uh, way to go about it. And of course, if you want a lot of flexibility uh, um, that uh, uh, in terms of designing a micro credential, then standalone uh, is, is the way to go. So that's the the whole story in one slide for you. And uh, with that, I thank you. And uh, we look forward to your questions.